Good morning, everyone. My name is Catherine Bohr. As chair of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Committee on Enhancing Coordination between Land-Grant Colleges and Universities, I would like to welcome everyone to today's virtual workshop session entitled, Enhancing Collaboration and Deepening Impact. Can data science and artificial intelligence, otherwise known as AI, enable new collaborative platforms between diverse land-grant institutions and create more impactful outcomes? To answer this question, we have a great keynote speaker and a wonderful group of discussants who will be introduced to you by Dr. Harold Schmidt, a member of our committee, who is also co-founder and general partner of March Capital US and a senior scholar in the Graduate School of Management at UC Davis. Harold will be moderating today's workshop. Unfortunately, due to the vagaries of international air travel, we will not be joined online this, today by Dr. Olga Bolden Tiller. As with Harold, Olga is also a member of our study committee, and she represents Tuskegee University as one of the collaborating institutions in the USDA NSF funded artificial intelligence institutes about which you will hear more later during the panel session. Olga's flight back from Ghana was delayed, so she is somewhere in the air over the Atlantic Ocean at this moment. We are very pleased that Tuskegee's Dr. Gregory Bernard has graciously agreed to participate in Olga's place on today's panel. Fortunately, Olga was able to record some introductory remarks to help set the stage for the workshop, which we're going to play in just a minute. But before we begin, I want to let you know that the meeting is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the project website about a week after today's meeting. Also, there are several other members of the study committee online today. And in the interest of time, rather than have them introduce themselves, I'm going to ask the study staff to put up a slide with a list of the committee membership. Today's virtual workshop, as well as one tomorrow afternoon on creating and sustaining a culture of collaboration are intended to inform the final report of the committee, which will be released in September. We are also in the process of organizing one final working session on the topic of capacity, and we hope to announce the date and the time for that session soon. The committee's report will make recommendations on how to encourage collaborations across the land-grant system that will be successful and impactful. So we are looking forward to a robust discussion today that will help provide the committee with insights as it develops those recommendations. During the question and answer period, I'd like to ask everyone online to please be mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions about anything yet. So please don't leave this workshop today thinking otherwise. Comments made by members of the committee should not be interpreted as positions of the committee. Further, please recognize that committee members typically ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. I would also like to note that there is a Q&A box that the public can use to ask questions of today's speakers, and we will aim to get some of those questions answered as time permits today. And so with these comments, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Harold for his remarks before we hear Olga's pre-recorded comments. So Harold, if you would, please. Thanks, Catherine. And just to make sure you can hear me. Yes. Good, excellent. Well, um, yeah, thanks very much for that, Catherine. Looking forward to the session. Um, I'll, uh, we, we've been talking about um, the you know, sort of profound role that data science and artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, advanced data analytics can play in terms of you know, the way it's reinvented collaboration um, across many sectors. Food and agriculture is no different and will be no different. So um, the topic is, is perfect for you know, the mission of this committee and we're looking forward to that. So I'll, um, 
I'll I'll stop there and and let's. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Olga's comments, even though they uh, they were done under duress, clearly. <laughs> but thank goodness she was able. You know, talk about connectivity across the world. She was still able to do that. With, you know, put these together, which is great. So I'll, I'm looking forward to hearing her comments. Obviously, we've been talking ahead of this session, and then we'll come back and I'll introduce Tom and and we'll get we'll get to his comments. Hello. And welcome to the first installment of workshops for enhancing coordination between land grant universities and colleges. My name is Dr. Olga Bolden Tiller, and I serve as the Dean and Research Director for the College of Agriculture, Environment, and Nutrition Sciences at Tuskegee University, and am a proud member of the Blue Ribbon Panel for this program. Earlier this year, a group the Blue Ribbon Panel on Enhancing Coordination Between Land-Grant Universities and Colleges was brought together to identify key factors for successful outcomes of coordinated and collaborative projects between colleges and universities in the land-grant system, including those involving historically Black colleges and universities and other institution types, which address national challenges and global food security. In the spring of this year, the panel provided preliminary observations about the nature of collaborative activity across the land grant system and the potential to enhance its impacts. These preliminary observations were open for comments from the public, which have served to inform a series of workshops, including this one today, which is entitled Enhancing Collaboration and Deepening Impact. Can data science and artificial intelligence enable new collaborative platforms between diverse land-grant institutions and create more impactful outcomes? The preliminary observations focus on a variety of factors, including case studies, such as the Collaborative Artificial Intelligence Institutes funded by USDA, MIFA, and NSF, which in 2020 were initiated to accelerate research, expand America's workforce, and transform the future of the system. However, the power of data science and analytics in food and agriculture can only fulfill its potential if all land grants contribute and have access to well-curated and properly integrated data assets. Today, we have the opportunity to learn how data science, including predictive analytics and artificial intelligence, can transform the food and agriculture sector for members of these institutes and explore how initiatives such as the AI institutes can be optimized in the future to enhance land-grant institution collaborations by looking at barriers to collaborations as well as examples of how some of these barriers were overcome as a part of the establishment of institutes, such as the AI Farms Institute, Artificial Intelligence for Future Agricultural Resilience Management and Sustainability, which is led by the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, in collaboration with a number of institutions, including the University of Chicago, Michigan State University, Argonne National Labs, USDA ARS, the Danforth Plant Science Center, and my home institution, Tuskegee University, in collaboration with partners such as Earth Science, Microsoft, and IBM. When exploring enhancing coordination between land-grant universities and colleges, 17 preliminary observations were identified, which fell into one of four sections or categories. These findings were open for comments in the spring of the year, and these comments serve to inform the workshops, such as the one here today. The four sections included collaboration in the land grant system. This collaboration was identified, but it was noted that it didn't expand to all land grant institution types equally. Section two, the rationale for collaboration. There are questions that need to be addressed that are ever evolving, and it will take input from everyone to find the answers to ensure maximum impacts. And thirdly, 
which accounted for eight of the 17 preliminary findings, fell into section three, barriers to collaboration and ideas for overcoming them. And finally, section four of the preliminary report, amplifying and communicating the impacts and outcomes of collaboration. It was noted that collaborations will need to change and evolve and can take time to address key questions and issues that will have broad impacts. For our AI Farms Institute, additional ones included a lack of information about the distribution of expertise at institutions across the land grant system or of other valuable assets that could make the collaboration be more enhanced the time available for planning collaborations, leading collaborations that require team building. And this is not always a skill set that is had by individuals who might be leading these different types of collaborations. And then the institutional differences related to administrative procedures and policies, especially as they pertain to different institution types. I have included an asterisk by several of the barriers or challenges that we face as a part of AI Farms, which included the four seen here, as well as items seven and eight with the historical inequities for having handicapped the ability of 1890 institutions to be full partners, as well as insufficient or inadequate time and resources to support new collaborative projects. These were some of the barriers that we indeed did identify as a part of the creation of the AI Farms Institute. And I look forward to the discussion, the robust discussion in the second hour where these barriers were addressed in terms of how they could be overcome so that we could successfully become a part of one of the artificial intelligence institutes. Thank you for your time. We look forward to this discussion and your participation today and the outcomes of this program. Well, that, that um, pretty much summarized why I really, really enjoy working with Olga. That was, um, <laughs> even, even, when she's, even when she's flying back from you know, a long business trip, she's able to absolutely you know, summarize and put things out there perfectly. So that was a, couldn't, you know, that was a perfect um, setup for our session today. And Tom, sorry, you're gonna have a difficult act to follow after that. So I hope you've got a lot of answers um, <laughs> from that. So I, I'll, I'll introduce, um, you know, there's a great setup. I'll introduce Tom now and turn it over to him. Um, so Tom, uh, he's his, the, 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 the position he's currently in is Vice Chancellor for Information Technology and Data at the University of California, Irvine and University of California Health and he's responsible for ensuring the effective and strategic use of data and technology across all aspects of the enterprise. Um, so, you know, honestly, the the sorts of you know, the sorts of framing or the the framing that Olga just did, and and the sorts of barriers, you know, these are things that that Tom works with on a on a daily basis in his current position. And I got to know him actually when he was at the UC system. Um, position. So University of California <clears throat> Office of the President, where he was Vice President and Chief Information Officer um, in Oakland. And, and I, I got to know Tom as he was, you know, doing this sort of difficult task and overcoming many of the barriers that, that Olga just laid out um, in terms of, of cross-campus integration of really complicated, you know, um, uh, digital assets or data assets. And prior to this, Tom has significant um, industry experience in the healthcare industry, and and um, has you know he's essentially made a career out of um, building bridges, spanning differences between organizations to get to a better place. And he's he's uh, he's he's a an exemplary leader in terms of collaborative innovation, and especially in the data sciences space. So it's a real pleasure to have him here. And Tom, you know, turn it over to you now and, and looking forward to what you've got to say. The goal is to uh, finish 
your presentation in no more than 30 uh, minutes and then have 15 minutes for some q a and i'll start off with a few questions and then then turn it over to the to the committee um, to ask theirs so um, over to you and looking forward to hearing hearing your thoughts fantastic thank you and uh you know howard thank you for the introduction to the committee thank you very much uh, this is, um, you know, an honor to be able to kind of share some of my experiences, insights, learnings along the way. Uh, so much of what has been said already about reinventing collaboration, collaboration needs to change and evolve, are things that I truly believe in. And I'm going to share a little bit about the evolution of how I got here to what I'm doing today and the things along the way that have shaped that point of view and the people who helped have also uh, influence that point of view, and then share, uh, because I, I consider myself still in a lot of ways an outsider, spending a majority of my career in industry, as I'll show you very quickly, uh, but now enough years inside of um, research university environments to be able to understand enough to be able to share my perspectives about how things could be different, and I'm going to share those examples as we go through. And so I'm going to I'm going to go right here and say, look, you know, Harold shared about my background. I've spent time, a lot of time in the healthcare industry. I've been both a technology executive and a business executive in that capacity. Uh, I'm going to talk about when I came to the University of California eight years ago, first at a system role. And for those of you who are part of university systems, uh, you know that uh, while you're a system and you're one entity on one respects in a lot of ways, you're very autonomous in the way that you operate and in the way that you collaborate. But one of the things that I thought I would share, because it's really important to the strategies that I've been asked to build and how I've gone about trying to build these collaborative models, is what I call the people that I've had a chance to interact with and work with and work under over the course of my career, which I call X-factor leaders or transformational leaders. These are people who bring big changes to environments that they're asked to lead in and the characteristics that I think make them special that I try to emulate in how I behave, but also to bring strategies that I see them use in the terms of the impact they're trying to bring into the environment that I'm asked to impact today. And so, you know, just real quickly, five characteristics I see very, saw very consistently in that. And again, I've worked across on four different continents. So my experiences are shaped by leaders from the United States, from Europe, from China, um, you know, from South America. So I have a broad base of experience in terms of kind of where I've seen leadership, um, let's say, um, uh, practiced. But first thing that great leaders do is they take the complexity that comes along with our world and they bring it down to simplified narratives and worldviews that are helpful for large amounts of people to understand and line themselves up around. This is something that has to be done and comes into how do you get multiple institutions together. They drive the ambitions for the whole enterprise. Even though they have an area of responsibility, they think about the entire organization that they're a part of. And for the context here, I'm going to change enterprise to the word ecosystem because we need to think about developing ecosystems. And we're going to talk about what that means and how we have enabled that in our strategies and really put it to work through data platforms and data science platforms. Um, they embrace and evangelize, and this is not a unique term, this actually comes back from a book that was published in the 90s, uh, the genius of the and. They don't let people settle on or, it's this or that. They drive their, you know, the, the conversation into, we can do this and that. And that's very, very important in ecosystem thinking. They play well on teams that they don't lead. We can all, everyone I'm sure who's joined this call understands leadership and how to move a topic and an organization forward. But can you do that when you're not in the driver's seat? I've seen great leaders understand the value of influence, the value of bridge building, the value of molding ideas and conversations. And this is something that excellent transformational leaders do. And of course, they think about not just effective teams, but building the leaders uh, that that need to drive the organization because you never do these things alone. I share these with you because they've been important to the way that I think about the, the problem that uh, that you've asked me to talk about today, and I wanted to share that beforehand. And so if we think then about, you know, the question that Harold asked me to come and talk about in my experiences, I'm going to start with the one that he mentioned when he and I were first introduced. Um, I, my role as Chief Information Officer at the University of California 
was really one to say, how do we strategically think about the use of technology going forward? And in my experiences coming out of healthcare and the transformations of healthcare in terms of the power around data, um, was we really needed to think about the data assets that we had and how do we start leveraging them at a, to generate higher levels of value. Uh, in 2015, now we're now going back seven years ago, I pitched a strategy to the health side of the university with its six health centers and said, you know, we did not have, you know, an aggregated patient database of our patients that we had been seeing in our health systems. Uh, seems crazy when I think about it today, but if you've been to one UC, you've been to one UC. There's a lot of autonomous operation, even though we're under one board of regents, you know, the autonomy of decision-making has always been such that it actually can be as difficult to get UC Davis and UCLA to work together as could be to get UC Davis to work with Cleveland Clinic. And so we had to go through an exercise of building a collaborative framework for how do we bring this data together. That was partially technical, but much more importantly, it was the organizational construct, the rules of engagement for how we were going to do this. And what I put on the right side there is, you know, we have now a mechanism for now maintaining this data asset. And you can see the size and scale that we're able to do. Um, and this is only for electronic health records, uh, but it shows you that 17 million represented lives, right? And you can see the, the number of procedures, uh, you know, over 500 million procedures, over 2 billion vital signs and test results. So these are things now that over time have generated, and we generated a uh, what we call this Center for Data-Driven Insights and Innovation, now led by Dr. Atul Butte, who has a, his appointment at UCSF and operates as our UC Health Chief Data Scientist. Uh, this sits under him. But you can see now that we've taken this data asset and we've put it to work across a variety of different value propositions for the university. Ones that impact the quality of care and our ability to uh, look at populations and, and study things like health disparities, uh, to look into actual the specifics of clinical outcomes and how do different types of patients with different types of diseases, maybe using different types of drugs that, that are prescribed to them, how do those outcomes differ and why, and why do they happen in, at different ratios at different facilities? Uh, we use it now, those same data assets, and put it in the hands of our researcher and drive both our basic as well as uh, translational clinical science uh, and research programs, right? So what we've done is we've built a data asset uh, and we've now put it to, to work to create the, you know, the best research that we possibly could for any researcher who wants to leverage this data that drives our clinical enterprise, which is seeing millions of patients every year and trying to provide the best quality of care. Because we're part of the public system, roughly 30% of the population that we see comes from, you know, the Medicaid, uh, you know, Medicaid pool. We really, really look at the, you know, how do the disparities of access to health and the quality of care that they receive, how does that differ? Because we have these things at scale and can compare them. So it truly is an asset that is driving both the research and practice of healthcare in our enterprise. Now, I've thrown, this, I've thrown a blank slide in here as a, as a way to remind me to tell you a story. Uh, as Dr. Butte and I were building this, there were, a, there were some things that we realized. And one of the things we realized is that no one's got enough data to really look and study the really complex problems that come along with healthcare. And so in uh, late 2016, early 2017, we embarked on an effort to reach out to a small number of colleague institutions. These are institutions I'm not going to name, but you would know them. They are all in the top 10 recognized by a U.S. News and World Report, very much known for not just the quality of care that they give, but also for their, their research prowess. And we approached them and said, look, what we've done at the University of California with our health systems bringing our data together, we think is expandable to a multi-institutional play and to really build up an ecosystem of you know, academic medical centers who are looking at very, very large populations, but also tapping into the best minds that go beyond even what the University of California could amass. Uh, here's what's really interesting about that conversation. At the CEO level and chancellor level of those organizations, 
we had complete alignment that this was the right thing to do. This, there was value for all of us doing this. Where we got stuck was in a lot of the compliance, regulatory, legal, privacy. We had hurdles there that both uh, organizationally, those organizations couldn't get comfortable with. And um, also from a technology perspective, we didn't have the type of platforms we needed to demonstrate that we could satisfy the requirements that were coming out of some of those functions. And so ultimately the energy dissipated and we never pulled it off. Now, I tell you that story because when I came to uh, Irvine, which was a specific choice and a, a role that we created here uh, around the strategic use of data and technology, it was with things that, that were, I was informed by by that last effort. Number one was we only did at the University of California with our UC Health Clinical Data Warehouse, the electronic health record data, which is very robust and, and, and is what clinicians use every day and what they use to drive decisions. But it was only one type of data to really understand the individual, whether that individual be a patient or a health consumer who wants to stay healthy. And the reality is, is the explosion of data in healthcare all right, now allows us to understand an individual on a phenotypic, genotypic, multiomic, molecular, behavioral, and environmental level. And we can track that now longitudinally over time. All right, and so it's with that as I came to Irvine and, and they said, look, we need you a unique strategy that's going to differentiate us from you know, our peers across the country. It was with the concept of the explosion of there were things that were changing that we were going to build our strategy around. Data explosion is just one aspect of it, right? And that these data types are not just available, but they come in very, very different formats, and that needs to be supported in some way. And the evolution of platforms between what we were talking about in 2016, 2017, and the platforms that we've been able to build our strategies around today have evolved and better supported this concept of multimodal data platforms that allow you to bring together, in, in our specific example, alphanumeric data uh, that comes out of the electronic health record, a medical image, a genomic uh, data set, a waveform that comes from an EKG or something taken, an EEG of the brain. So we're able to integrate those things together. Clearly, one of the things that has emerged a lot in the last, you know, depending if you want to say last five years or 10 years, is the, the reemergence of AI. I was trained in some of these things when I was at university a very, very long time ago. I was also trained as a systems thinker. And so now that we have enough data, we can now use some of these advanced analytical techniques that we just couldn't, didn't have the data for, and we didn't have the computing platforms to take advantage of. These things have now become more mature. Uh, and the concept also of distributed analytics, that the data does not have to all be brought to one place, but that we can do analytics in a more distributed platform, allowing data to be, you know, um, separate from the standpoint of how it's protected and accessed, but seen as one logical system from an analytical perspective. So these things have developed quite a bit over the last five years. It has changed the calculus around building our strategy. Two of the other things that I put at the bottom here are really important because we're talking about data science platforms to drive, um, to drive collaboration and, and evolve collaboration to new models. It starts with an understanding and building, and this is something that you know has taken time, but my role was really built around influence in the organization is data really is strategy. Right. Data is the value proposition. Data is the thing that can bring multi interdisciplinary professionals together with a commonality of something to work from. And then the second thing is, is to help the organization understand is the strategy I was building for UCI were not limited. And matter of fact, not designed just for UCI, but they were built around building ecosystems within which we were a part of building and facilitating and take advantage of network effect, which in network effect, the big thing is the more players that are involved, the more valuable the network becomes. And so I, you know, I launched a, a program under my office, you know, you know which um, we call the collaboratories at UCI. Uh, the first example is in healthcare, and I'll share examples out of healthcare, but it's not unique to healthcare. What we found is we stepped back from what we built for our, our health strategy, 
uh, is, uh, is let's say transferable to other domains because we found the first principles that allow you to basically define the steps of building uh, platforms and ecosystems. And so the word collaboratory is not a unique word. Uh, you know, it's, I found a definition going all the way back to 20, uh, 2007 around, it's really about facilitating human interactions around a common research area and providing access to people who are known and unknown. What we've done is we've repurposed that word and, and say, look, in the world that we live in today, data is the engine that drives insight, innovation, collaboration, and impact. And the unique thing of data as an asset is that single asset can serve multiple purposes at the same time. Very different from your automobile, which you're either driving and using or it's sitting in your, in your, in your driveway, right? And so we know that you know, we're using data as the engine. Data alone is not valuable, right? It takes people with the right contextual knowledge to really put data to work and develop insights from it. Uh, we think of these data assets as not just a data platform, but we call it a data operating system. And I'll show you an example of what we mean. It's like the data comes out of the environment in which it's generated. It's brought into an environment where it could be um, combined with other types of data given to broad sets of subject matter experts, insights develop, and then a mechanism to bring those insights back to the operating system, in this case, back to the clinical care environment where we actually deliver better care. And I'll share you a specific example of that that came out of the, the pandemic. And then our collaboratories are not confined to UCI. Matter of fact, they're better if they are not confined to UCI because we want to really drive the ecosystem. And the ecosystems are driven around enablement, connectedness, inclusiveness, and boundaryless in the way that we define them. And so this is just a picture of how I describe to people what a collaboratory is doing. It's bringing together lots of different types of partners and actors around data, where the goals are drive better outcomes, drive more impact, drive you know, deeper uh, research. And it becomes things that attract the right type of partners to us, whether those are partners are giving us complementary capabilities or partners who sometimes bring to us the dollars that drive the development of the platform or activity within the ecosystem. I won't go into detail, but you know, one of the things is we did this in the healthcare and we stood up the Collaboratory for Health and Wellness, we came to a strategic decision that we wanted to build an institute uh, on top of the collaboratory concept. And so we represent it as the collaboratory is really the axis of the wheel. And then we are putting these pieces and parts uh, from across our university institution uh, who are bringing in. What's interesting is that every time I show this slide, and if I show it to you three months from now, there's a new player that's coming around this wheel because we keep tapping into different subject matter experts because they bring an expertise and a perspective to the data that may not have been represented before. And so the value grows as we add more and more players into the collaboratory and ecosystem concept. I thought I'd mention in terms of what we're doing is, you know, there, there's aspects to this and sometimes it can get hard to distinguish about whether we're talking about the platform that the data exists within and the platform, which is what we're facilitating by the collaboratory. Certainly there's a lot about, you know, data here. How do you structure the data? How do you do metadata management? How do you harmonize the data, whether it's coming data coming from different institutions for harmonization? or harmonizing uh, data on the dimension of it's coming from different sources and how do we bring together EHR data uh, and uh, medical imaging data all right, or data that's coming out of a federal registry. There's way in which we continue to invest and improve the quality and value of the data asset. There's ways that we control the who accesses the data and around what rules. Uh, there are ways in which that we're facilitating these interactions where we're able to actually take it all the way back to demonstrating attribution to where did the data come from that was used in, in building the model, uh, as well as, you know, who were the key players if we get the publication to go back and who really contributed into this. These are things that this platform can do. We've designed the platform to do and we're leveraging and testing out more and more and how we can do that. Uh, the whole idea here is that we want to facilitate team science through the platform 
and generate new insights. And I'm gonna start by telling you a story that happened during the pandemic. Uh, it's a UCI story, but we're, you know, it parlayed itself into a multi-institutional story. Uh, we had this concept stood up for UCI uh, when uh, the pandemic and the surges hit. And we put this model to work where we took data out of the health systems about the COVID patients that were coming into our facility who were landing into inpatient stays. We brought them back to the, to let's call it the data science platform. And we built a predictive model around really understanding which patients were the most sick and that were going to be the most likely to land into an inpatient stay or into the ICU. But we didn't just build a predictive model. We took the model back into the patient care environment. And then under the, you know, under the guidance of our chair of medicine, it became a tool that was used within the clinician workflow. So we put it in from a predictive model. We ran it alongside so that clinicians could see it as kind of an A-B test. When we thought that that model could actually help us make better, faster decisions around patients, you know, we now implemented into the workflow and it became part of our standard you know, care um, uh, workflow practice. Uh, that turned out to be a really good decision because when we were benchmarked after uh, the winter of 20, uh, 2021 surge, uh, UCI uh, had the second best survivability rate of COVID inpatient uh, stays of anywhere in the country benchmarked by a third party organization. We brought that back to not just the fact that we had data, curated data, built a model, but that we actually had a process for implementing that model back into the patient care uh, environment. And then also continuing to feed the data as we were making decisions back into the data science platform and continuing to revalidate validate and update the model so that, that that the model would stay current with the, with the patients that we were seeing and treating. This caught the attention of the White House Task Force for COVID and they asked us to apply our, the model to monoclonal antibodies uh, and because they had come out with emergency use and we were one of the facilities that was using it and what we found through our models was that the criteria by which uh, patients were allowed to be um, prescribed it was far too narrow. And so our model showed informing policy that we could actually extend the model to more patients. And that became a critical influence for them to revise the protocol and ultimately more patients across the United States were able to get access to that. The same group came back and then funded us to work on a multiple uh, institutional basis. Uh, we've got some published work, so I can say it was with the Mayo Clinic it was with Intermountain in, in, in the, uh, the Mountain, uh, Mountain West region and with uh, Houston Methodist and UCI. We actually used patient data, we used imaging data, we used genomic data around patients and we actually informed understanding patients along with the variants that they got. So we now proved out that we could move this to a multi-institutional model and we also proved out that using the platforms that, you know, that we had developed, we could deliver data faster and at higher quality than some of the other institutions that we work with. Um, you know, this operating system for us is also around putting the scaffolding around it, you know, to be able to support the research interaction. So we found value in putting a, a collaboratory front door on the, on the front end. Uh, it's not just about having a platform, it's about helping helping whoever wants to work with the data get to the right data with the right tools and the right type of computing platforms to do the work that they want to do. You have to facilitate, you know, not just the research, but the interactions and the parties involved in the research. And we've set up mechanisms for doing that. Um, another slide, because I want to tell another story. Uh, you know, we were asked to pitch an NIH uh, grant that they, uh, that they put out uh, last year wanting to look at the intersection of health disparities and artificial intelligence and how these two things um, could uh, be addressed through AI, much the same types of, of questions we're, we're, we're asking here uh, in uh, land grants and agricultural systems. We pitched this concept to them. Um, we pitched the concept that, look, it's not just about data platforms, it's about an ecosystem where you're able to onboard organizations who actually have the data on the underserved of this nation, which we actually have a really good partner. I happen to be on their board. 
uh, that you bring the data in, you put the data to work through your data science platforms, you generate insights and tools, but really importantly, if you want to have real impact, is you have to be able to push those tools back out to the people who are actually caring for the patients and do it in such in a way that they can actually use these tools to deliver better care and the feedback mechanism to, uh, to, to uh, be able to improve those models over time. Um, the concept for not just a data infrastructure, so we pitched the building a data ecosystem, not just a data infrastructure. You know, and, and the way I describe it is, I, I, it's a little of this, right? Which is people are really busy. People have built their careers around certain success and certain paradigms. You know, the, the concept of incremental improvements, you know, kind of can make sense if I can find the time and the energy to think about something different. But what we were pitching is something com completely different for that person on the left. We were pitching a platform and we were pitching not just solving, taking rocks, you know, from the hillside, you know, to building the wall. We were talking about a platform that's going to take water from the river to the village and to take crops from the field to the village and take people from this village to that village. We were pitching something very, very different. We just don't think they were able to wrap their head around what we were trying to offer. So we didn't stop. Right. Uh, you know, we actually have gone out and found a set of like minded people and are taking this concept through a public private partnership that we call the global health ecosystem. Uh, what I can tell you is we have an FFRDC involved. We have members of, uh, of the federal government involved. We have academic institutions involved. We have technology companies involved. We have life sciences companies and pharma companies involved already around this concept of not just building a data infrastructure or a data science platform, but really building an ecosystem that allows you to bring parties together, onboard them quickly, and solve problems by bringing the right data together, uh, making it in the most usable form that you need for the problem statement that has been generated, or let's say it has been asked, and how to do that at velocity and at scale. And you know, we've even now had uh, discussions with regulators from the healthcare environment wanting to come in who are really wanting to say, look, the real world evidence aspect has to become part of the way that we think about bringing things, whether they be drugs or medical devices to market. So we wanna understand this uh, global health ecosystem concept for how can we use the data to actually help us get to decisions, better decisions faster from a regulatory perspective which is quite unique and means that people are trying to think outside the box. So, um, you know, just to kind of wrap up, you know, the collaboratory concept for us at UCI, you know, is being extended to other domains. Uh, certainly the, the one I've talked about here and the one that's most mature today is around our health and wellness initiative and how we're building an ecosystem that parties from across the country can play. Um, we're doing the same thing around student success initiatives where we're now we have the same type of platform and the same type of multi-institutional collaboration that's coming together. And the one that I'm um, really trying to take the playbook out and apply against is how do we think about the same thing from a climate solutions sustainability perspective? Certainly a lot of diverse types of data that needs to come together, lots of institutions who are really asking themselves, how do we work closer together and to bring things to impact more quickly? Uh, and so that's also something that I'm working with our domain experts on for that. Uh, just some final thoughts. Um, you know, I, I think just in general, with, with the, this group, uh, you know, what this committee is talking about is really important, as is, you know, we have to think about what does it mean to be a research university in the 21st century? That's something that our chancellor and provost has me to bring to the table and to push the conversation about how we need to evolve and change. And, and say it's not just about what we've done in the past about creating and disseminating knowledge. It's not just about the models we use today for um, you know, grant funding and you know, these universities have agreed to work together, but to really think about platforms that can curate, aggregate, curate, and build valuable data assets that can be addressed, uh, that could be put against specific problem statements that are generated. Uh, regardless of whether those problem statements come out of the federal government, some other funding agency, or private industry, uh, that you know we spend our time putting our knowledge into practice, like we did in the COVID example, um, and that you know that we take our practices and we export them and facilitate larger ecosystems. But everybody's got data, right? Uh, and typically, as universities, we've gone from data to information to knowledge, and we've stopped there. 
we have to be in the insight and wisdom game, you know, from my perspective. And that's what I've been bringing to our strategic conversations. Um, the reason I talk about this concept of, uh, you know, coming out of industry, one of the things you learn is that there's different types of innovation, right? Uh, there's product innovation, there's process innovation, and then there's business model innovation. And any business professor of innovation will tell you that the most impactful you know, uh, is the business model innovation. It's what drives the investment from, you know, from venture capital and private equity. It's what drives valuations. And so what we're really talking about here and what I'm challenging the group to maybe think about is don't just think about data science platforms, but think about the ecosystems that you can generate and facilitate by using these platforms and putting data at the center of the conversation. Decisions get made off of data by subject matter experts who know how to do something, who understand the context around the data and can do something novel and different with them. And so really what we're talking about here and what the evolution should be um, to be focused on is not incremental, but really a business model information to really reestablish what it means to be a research university or a set of land grant universities. Uh, this slide is really new. Uh, it, in, it comes from industry. It's what if you are in corporate America and you're talking about your innovation strategies, this is the kind of slide that your head of strategy or your head of it, your chief innovation officer is bringing to the executive uh, boardroom. It talks about innovation on the front end and the back end. Um, what's interesting and why I put that in there is with or without us, industry is doing this already, thinking this way already. And we run the risk of being less relevant in their world if we don't match them or potentially lead them in the ecosystem development. What's interesting, if you look at this slide, I could give you a version of this slide from 2016 that had everything at the top, but not this at the bottom. This is what's been brand new. And if you think about, you know, kind of what I talked about, it's about changing away from thinking about innovation as being new ideas that we talk about from our enterprise versus creating an ecosystem that has ideas sourced from everywhere, collaborators from everywhere that we facilitate bringing together. What brings them together? I, 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 I would argue to you that it's the data that is the common clay that the artisans are working with together. And some of the things I've learned about building these ecosystems is you have to have um, somebody responsible for cultivating it, for establishing the rules around it, whether it's the rules of engagement, creating the sense of community, ensuring that the right data is there and that, that you have the right uh, metadata management strategy, someone has to own that how the rules are for on-ramping new uh, entrants into the ecosystem is really important. Because remember, in ecosystems, the number of participants is the, is the key, um, the number of participants and the number of connections are the key measures of success. And so um, this is some of the things that I've learned. And just want to say at this point, I'd love to have a dialogue with uh, with the committee members and thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate today. Tom, that was fantastic. And so we've got about 10 minutes here. Um, and, and also we can, um, for the next session, wrap, you know, you're, you're sort of part of the ecosystem, so to speak here. So um, anyway, so we, we can also, you know, have questions run into that. So quick, one quick comment is, a lot of what you spoke about really, really tied together very well with our previous workshop, which was on team science and a great um, presentation by, by Jenny Cross on that, you know, and your X Factor leader played there, but also um, a gentleman uh, named Andy Hargadon at UC Davis and Jenny both talk about, you know, the network piece. So I learned the phrase, um, you know, it's not the product that's the innovation, it's the network that's the innovation. And I think that's, you know, baked into your comments and baked into our, you know, land grant collaborations. And I think you added to it with this data is the strategy. So I just wanted to really make sure we don't lose that point as the committee goes, you know, forward with its thinking is that data is, you know, data is more than an asset. It, it actually can be and should be the strategy at a certain level. So really key point. So I've got two questions that, 
I want to make sure get asked that, you know, drive um, committee, you know, thinking and deliberations. And then if we have time, you know, we, we can we can take in a few more. But one is um, one is that every time you, you know, use some sort of health or health care type of terminology. So, you know, precision health or, you know, patient care, you know, or, or whatever. You know, for me, I, I, I hear uh, precision agriculture, precision nutrition, plant health instead of patient health, instead of global healthcare ecosystem, global food, you know, and agriculture ecosystem or, you know, land grants ecosystem. So I guess the point is, you know, I, 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 I hear the data science and advanced analytics piece as an agnostic platform, but there's more, there's more to it than, than just that. So I'd, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on A, you know, just to drive the point of, of everything you were saying has application to food and ag. I think that's correct, but it'd be good to hear from you on that. And then number two is from a, you know, think, you know, unique strategy thinking perspective for food and ag, given that you have spent your time in the University of California and food and ag has been part of your remit. If you could comment on any unique strategy aspects we should be thinking about there, as opposed to what you did with the health and healthcare piece. Yeah, so the, so the first question, absolutely. And that's why the collaboratories at UCI, you know, is, is a program and not just specific to health, right? Because as we step back, what we saw, and this is where, you know, I'm not trained as a clinical professional, right? I, I'm really a, you know, a business technologist. And so as I step back and I listen to people's vocabulary from different domains, what resonates to me is the commonality, you know, of what, we're, uh, of what people are talking about, just contextually different. And so... I think it absolutely applies to the food and ag space, right? I mean, there's data being generated. The sensors that are being deployed are more and more, right? So the data volume is exploding. The diversity around the data that you want to combine together, the different subject matter experts that you're asking to bring together and create team science is, is diversifying all the time. You have, you know, federal entities that are interested in funding, but who also have a regulatory role. So I think, I think the model fits very well to food and ag, right? And, and again, this is, you know, what I see is that it, it's a playbook. That's why I call it the playbook, right? The playbook just needs to be applied to a different context. The, the, the plays are going to be a little different, but the principles behind it are very similar. Can you repeat the second question? Yeah. So the so the 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 second question is is you know yes so great on the playbook similar you know agnostic yes but you know given your experience with the UC and and having food and ag on your plate is there something you know particular from a strategy orientation perspective that you would say we need to pay particular attention to from the land grant side in that regard that's different than 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 the strategy you deployed in health and healthcare. I don't know if I think, I think of anything that's different, right? I think um, I think the the concept that can get very vexing when you kind of get into the details is the you know in healthcare we call it meta metadata management, right? It's really around the definitions of the data and how much alignment that we that can you get around that, and, um, and I think that that's something that you know a multi institutional coalition should come together and put some standards around somewhere along the line earlier is better. Uh, the other thing is, is the capabilities to link data sets that are really, really different because those th that doesn't happen. Um, it takes work. It takes work and it takes expertise. And there should be a capability built that is likely to, likely for most universities, unaffordable, but collectively shared you know, is both good from the standpoint of sharing the cost of building that capability, as well as the diffusion of that capability existing in different environments where then many institutions could be taking advantage of kind of a common built capability. So those are the two that come to mind quickly here. All right, and then just one other question, and then there's a couple in the Q&A and, and, uh, um, and there's a hand up from one of the participants. But the other question is, um, so sort of building on the genius of and that you mentioned, um, with the land grants, we have the, you know, the 1862s, 1890s, 1994s. And so, you know, the, really we have this opportunity to enhance collaboration between all the land grants. So in this context of the genius of and, 
what I mean, are there things that come to mind for you where it's like, actually, you know, although there's a lot of barriers and, and Olga did a great job of laying out those barriers, the opportunity you see in terms of using data science to enable the 62s, 90s and 94s to collaborate, is there something special there that you would be excited about? actually just out of curiosity yeah I th well i think i think there's a couple of things that, that come to mind so so one is is you know the, the concept around you know the the ecosystem and the network effect and in, in, you know like we, we very specifically put inclusiveness as one of the the characteristics around our concept which is you know we want to invite all players and all players to have equal kind of value and participation because those institutions have diff just different perspectives Different history, lived experiences, and 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 different perspectives, but they're very valuable to studying the problems that that we have in our society. Um, the other thing is is the the opportunity around training grants and training grants and how those things can be strategically used, not just to build capabilities, but building capabilities into our underrepresented groups across the country. Uh, we both have those in the form of training grants, and my office actually has has built a. I'm just calling it a an experiential learning program. So so that our we have underrepresented students who complement what they learn in the classroom with going out and solving real world problems. And those aren't just in healthcare, but they're using data science and they're out there solving problems in healthcare, in health and wellness, now in understanding uh, climate issues. And so I think it's the opportunity of, of, of finding those underrepresented populations and bringing opportunity to them to build skills, but also to have experiences that will help them, you know, as they leave university and, and go and build their careers and lives. Awesome. And so one time for one more question and Vikram, since you're going to be talking soon, I'm going to, um, I'm going to enable our committee chair, Catherine, to ask the question. So, so Catherine, you get executive privilege. Um, what, what's your question? Well, thank you very much, Harold. And wonderful, wonderful presentation, uh, Tom. So thank you so much. I am so intrigued by the fact that, that, that you reached out to a variety of different institutions in an area that frankly is fairly easy to imagine the value of developing a, a system for data sharing, uh, which is healthcare and well-being. And, and the, the larger the data set, obviously, the more robust your outcomes uh, as you understand what's going on with people. And yet you ran into the set of barriers, particularly, I'm going to call it at the risk management legal area, if I understood you correctly, uh, it really right at that space. And so my question is, do you think, and this is just an opinion question, that, that it, the passage of time since the time when you, you reached out to try to start that and the uh, pandemic and the success that you have now been able to demonstrate with the network that you've built among the UCs, do you think you might get a different kind of re reception uh, to, to that notion of, of creating that kind of network uh, several years ago? And, and if so, um, what do you think that the biggest changes might be? Uh, so the answer is yes, right? I think, you know, I think even without the pandemic, we would have had some movement as, as, you know, as more examples are out there and more opportunities to challenge. You've said no, but look at these organizations that are saying yes, and look at the benefit that comes, right? Because it's a balancing test of, the opportunity that comes through data with the risks of violating privacy reg regulation, et cetera. So, uh, we, you know, we have a very, um, I actually am responsible uh, for the, the governance, data governance conversations at our institution, regardless of what type of data. So I think it did. And I think the pandemic also, because it forced us to do things that we just couldn't, we couldn't come to the normal no to. There were just too many lives at risk. And so it, it's accelerated our acceptance of things uh, that, um, that, that I think is help healthcare and will help healthcare. Now, that being said, I'll go back and saying that University of California, we've always kind of put ourselves out there saying we want to convene people. And so we had back in 2017, after we built the clinical data warehouse and people started challenging what we were using it for, we convened a set of experts across our institution, invited outside experts, and we actually had a health data task force commissioned by our president. And there's a report that comes out of that, but the more important thing is the informed conversations that happened in the committee and then um, cross-pollinate into the local conversations, which 
it's not that people are closed minded. It's just they haven't necessarily thought and heard from enough other perspectives to get to a common shared understanding of yes, right? And or what's the right path to yes. So the governance part, right, which again, I think the ecosystem can play a role in bringing the right set of subject matter experts together to challenge convention for the sake of progress is an important thing that that needs to live somewhere. Where is that going to live as the land grant universities work together? Terrific. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we're going to, and there's actually a bunch of questions in the Q&A and et cetera. So I'll, I'll go through them for the ones that are directed to me. I'll, I'll answer them while our next speaker is presenting. Awesome. Well, there are some that are directed to you. So, <laughs> so yeah, enjoy that. Um, so we'll, for the next hour or 55 minutes or so, we'll switch over to the, um, to, to the section on the uh, on the USDA NEFA um, plus National Science Foundation funded initiatives in data sciences and advanced analytics, and you know that this was a uh, Tom really gave us a great view. I would say on the macro perspective um, at a you know and and a and sort of a global perspective, macros perspective, deep organizational perspective, etc. And now, you know, because of these USDA, NEFA, and NSF um, funded centers in data sciences and advanced data analytics focused on food and ag, um, we have this coincidentally really perfect, um, you know, early stage case studies, if you will, to, to take a look at collaboration between land grants and not just 1862s, but there's also um, one of the one of the groups represented here, and and Olga and the Tuskegee folks are part of it. Um, there's a 62 and a 90 um, collaboration, which is really cool. So we have an opportunity to dig into a couple of, you know, pilots, if you will, because it is early days. I think the first, um, I think the first uh, grants were given out in 2020, the first cycle, if I remember correctly. And then there's been another tranche, and, and I think there will be more. But Stephen Thompson will tell us more about that. But anyway, we have this great opportunity to match the zoom out, which I think Tom gave us a great look into, but in a very deep way. And now we're going to zoom in um, with some of these institutes that are focused specifically in the food and ag space and actually have as a key criteria the collaboration between um, uh, campuses and land grant campuses. So with that, um, what we're going to do, the format here will be approximately five uh, minute um, presentations by five of our panel members, which we're privileged to have join us here. And then after that, we'll, uh, we'll have a, a panel discussion. Again, I'll ask a few questions that are top of mind from a committee perspective, and then of course, open it up to the committee. And, and, uh, and if there's time, we'll also get to Q&A from the audience. But the, the running order here will be, um, we'll start with Stephen, um, then we'll go to Gabe, then Mason, then Vikram, um, and then Gregory. And so, um, with that, Stephen, um, I'd like for you to, um, if you're on, if you can go ahead and, and pop up. I um, you know, just want to introduce you. You're the National Program Leader, USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture and supporting research education extension activities there. And you've got a background in, in engineering processes and, and precision agriculture and, you know, clearly very, very well suited to be playing a key role in these um, data science initiatives and advanced analytics initiatives. And so we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts um, and looking forward to hearing your thoughts, especially on how these, and you know, these, this initiative can drive enhanced collaboration across land grants. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint for this five minutes. Uh, which you'll be glad to know. Um, yeah, that's refreshing. Good. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm basically going to, uh, you know, introduce the two that are coming. Uh, also, give you a couple of uh, updates on the data science and AI, um, or, or shall I say, AI-related initiatives that we have uh, collaborated with NSF uh, as a lateral. So. Um, as you probably know, um, USDA NIFA is the 
primary grant funding arm of the USDA. Um, in terms of the AI institutes, we have funded four of those. We have money for one more. Um, as far as I know, that's it. Uh, and, but the two you're gonna hear from are from the first year. You've already heard from Olga. Uh, the first year of funding. Um, on questions about various, I'd rather uh, take those in panel as they come with the, with the rest of them. I have two updates, however. Uh, we have a new program called the Open Data Framework that um, funds one grant to the tune of about a million. And it's basically set to create a uh, secure data repository and cooperative where producers, universities, and nonprofits can store and share data to foster ag innovation. And this is run by Ann Stapleton, who, by the way, works with me on the AI Institute. She handles most of the front end, the dealing with the panels and various things with Jim Donlin and Rebecca Hua. And I run, I, I manage uh, the back end primarily, the post award management. Both of us have a big job in our respective roles, but it works out really well. Um, then one more update, which is related to AI, is uh, you probably know that NSF is sunsetting the National Robotics Initiative um, in favor of the Foundational Research in Robotics Program. Uh, NIFA has decided to continue our uh, interface with the FRR program. So we're on the front end of um, getting that cleared and getting all the paperwork and collaborations. So uh, this was brief and I told you it would be. So I'm gonna turn it back to you, Harold. And uh, I look forward to seeing the presentations that are coming up. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Um, Stephen, so I've, I've, there's definitely a few questions that I, I know I want to ask you, but I'll, I'll respect what you said and, and wait to do it during the uh, during the panel session um, and appreciate those comments and that overview. So, Gabe, uh, you'll be up next and I'll let you um, introduce the, the crew that that uh, that you and Mason um, are representing APHIS alongside the AI farms piece. So. Gabe is the Chief Innovation Officer for University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources, UCANR. Wendy Powers, of course, is part of this committee and she's part of that crew. Um, and Gabe provides leadership to UCANR's Information Tech Unit to support programmatic educational, administrative, and marketing oriented um, projects. And Gabe is, you know, he's an extraordinary collaborator. He's got you know, great connectivity throughout the, the UC system. So, you know, thinks in cross campus ways um, within the system, but he also reaches out literally across the world in terms of multi-university interactions. He's been building relationships with, with European universities, especially Bakeningen and the, and the you know, the, the Dutch sort of cohort, but um, Gabe's, like Tom, is an exemplary, uh, you know, representative in terms of being a collaborative um, innovator. So Gabe, over to you for some comments um, regarding APHIS, and then, then we'll move on to Mason after that. Okay, <clears throat> so I do have slides, and I'm going to try to get through them really quickly in five minutes, because I do believe uh, pictures uh, can, can, you know, speak a thousand words here. So yeah, Gabe Yahtzee, Chief Innovation Officer. I won't uh, say more than Harold's generous introduction. Harold, thank you very much for that. Um, let, let me just uh, sort of move on to, um, can, you, can you guys see the screen? Make sure that you can see that. We can, yep, we can. So University of California is uh, one of the, if not the largest land grant institutions in the United States. Um, it has uh, 10 campuses, five medical centers, and three national laboratories and our statewide cooperative extension system run by UCANR. Um, you know, and, and as you can imagine, uh, collaborating across the UC itself is a challenge. Um, and so we have, of course, been collaborating extensively um, throughout, um, you know, the last hundred years, but internally across the vast networks can be a real key challenge with over 500,000 faculty, staff, and students. So, 
Um, just wanted to sort of set the stage of we've got a, a big UC system land grant system that we uh, collaborate with uh, and, and work to collaborate across, you know, really the nation of the world. Um, this diagram um, uh, I thought could be helpful to, uh, are you seeing land grant knowledge transfer? Do you see that? Okay. This uh, diagram really attempts to visualize how we knowledge transfer occurs, essentially collaborating with between industry and the public, really starting with colleges and universities, conducting basic and applied research that leads to academic public uh, publishing and teaching and training of students. In ag and natural resources, that may lead to pilots or demonstrations often delivered through cooperative extension. That is uh, through direct consultation by cooperative extension advisors and agents, field days and events, and very specific publications and tools that are really designed to be more traditional academic, uh, applied than ac traditional academic publications. And finally, an important uh, piece, newer piece, is the tech transfer and licensing to transfer that technology so it can grow, scale, and mature from lab to commercial product um, through either a student or faculty entrepreneur or partnering with a company. Um, in 2019, um, I think is the correct year, um, UC Davis, UC Berkeley, Cornell, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, USD ARS, and our own UC a &R, uh, came together, all land grants, to establish a new AI institute, uh, which Steve mentioned and has been previously mentioned through the NSF and USDA that really is aimed at leveraging AI to transform the food system and advance the state of AI itself. Um, and, and so that's really the mission is uh, tr leveraging transformative AI for ethical production of safe, sustainable, nutritious food with less resources. Um, so um, the um, focus of this uh, is a really across the whole entire food supply from the breeding of new crops to farming to food processing to advancing health and human nutrition and overall ensuring equitable, equitable participation and ethics of these new AI based technologies and the industries that are transformed by them um, and deploying the underlying and technologies that will ultimately lead to the transformation here. Uh, it's a very large team, APHIS is across institutions of faculty, staff, and students, and now an extended network of industry and undergraduate students as well. We've got a number of different projects here in these areas that are really aimed at produce, pro producing both what we would call use-inspired research, but also focusing on how do we translate these, these technologies and activities into the markets like open data collaboratives, and create new industry university partnerships that are driving new data sets that underlie all these new technologies that we're working to transform these industries. Uh, and then workforce development activities like career exploration fellowships and AI boot camps and creative ways to get young people and frankly new people of very diverse backgrounds and skill sets interested in food and agriculture through technology. So just some key takeaways as I try to stay within my five minutes. Um, really, AI and agri-food um, has required and will continue to require radical new collaboration across disciplines. And we have found in many cases that seasoned scientists in agri-food don't know the lingo of artificial intelligence and vice versa. So we're driving a lot of those radical new collaborations with institutes like this. Um, AI for agri-food is very early. Land grants can lead in this area through uh, data, data set development and a range of activities in partnership with each other and with industry um, and, and really establish leadership that will drive the, the future of these new technologies by working together. And lastly, um, really to leverage those land grant relationships to the food system. Every land grant has very, very deep ties to every part of the food system in their region. Um, we need to, to really tap into those and uh, connect them across regions um, so that we can uh, both really establish that, you know, sort of horizontal flow between all these diverse institutions, but also that vertical flow between industry and our governments and our regions of which we already have deep connections in the agri-food sector. So I'll leave it at that and turn it back to you, Harold. Thanks, Gabe. That was really, really helpful. Um, and so now Mason Earls will... Um will uh, make some comments. So Mason actually, he's an assistant professor at UC Davis, but he also um, 
he can't and the genius of and to build on Tom's you know commentary uh, Mason came out of Apple and so he's a you know exemplary sort of industry academic interface person and and um, and being here at UC Davis I'm able to actually watch him sort of integrate across um, colleges and schools as well. So not only industry academia, but within academia. So in any case, Mason is a key player in this AI Institute. So Mason, I'll turn it over to you for some comments. Great, thanks a lot, Harold. And thank you all for having me. I'll just jump right in since limited on time. My big goal here is to give an idea for some opportunities in terms of where we can find this interface between the AI institutes and land grants and academia in terms of uh, tech transfer and what we're doing and thinking how we can learn from what other industries have done. So here I've got a graph. This is a, from the AI index report in 2021 showing all of the AI job postings as a percent of the total job postings across numerous sectors in the economy. What you can actually see, it's funny because I think what we used to show a figure from McKinsey from about 2015 or 16, which would show the least digitized sector of the economy being agriculture. And maybe there's still a lot of truth to that, but we can also see here that there's a ton of hiring going on in agriculture for AI as of 2021. So if we look more specifically at this trend, you can also see that this is recent, right? This is a big uptick in the last two, three years in agriculture where we have a jump from 1% to over 2% of the total hirings happening just in a matter of a year. So there's a lot of interest in industry and a lot of effort going into this. You can see on the academic side as well that we have, when we do a quick search of machine learning and agriculture, or AI and agriculture, a really uh, exponential type of increase in the number of publications happening through 2021 up till 2025, where, I mean, of course, this is a line out, but we can see there's a lot of growth in the last few years that corresponds with what's happening in industry as well. So we've got a lot of interest in this idea of AI and agriculture and food. And so the question is, how we can amplify and accelerate the broader impacts of agricultural AI. And so we know that as these AI institutes, uh, one of our big roles is foundational R&D development, but infrastructure development, right? So how do we sort of develop the tools and infrastructure that can accelerate and amplify our impacts across society, food processors, farmers, and environments? So this is something we're really keen on understanding as a role. So to understand this better, perhaps we can look at other industries and where investments have been happening recently to think where we might find uh, models for this type of acceleration. So there's been a lot of money. This is showing the global private investment in AI by focus area in 2019 and 2020. And we can see that some of the top areas or maybe some of those application areas that we might think of are medicine. So drugs, cancer, molecular and drug discovery, which you've heard about earlier. Uh, autonomous vehicles and robotics are also a big one that have happened. And then a lot of this down here is actually a bunch of this is either infrastructure or finance and uh, kind of retail. Um, so what's happened across these industries that have been doing this a little longer than we have? Well, some of the infrastructure that's enabled this sort of amplification of impacts and acceleration of impacts are data set centralization and standardization, right? We need more data sets and we need them to be in one place, standardized, so that everyone doesn't need to remake the data set themselves. We need better model performance and benchmarking and competitions. This has been a huge part of developing a community and an interface between industry and academia and building around a common goal, whether that has to do with uh, examples of ImageNet for image classification, drug protein folding and discovery. There's been a lot of innovation around that and other types of medical imaging as well. One more of these, excuse me, is model code and weight training. This is once you've trained a model, we need to be able to share that code we used. And we need to more broadly as a community be sharing weights, meaning in other words, the, the trained brain of the model needs to be shareable, right? A whole nother piece of this, I think, is the development of AI coupled simulators. This has been a big thing that's happened across whether we're talking about robotics more generally in warehouse applications, or autonomous driving applications, simulators that might exist for simulating protein folding and molecular types of models, uh, or even, for example, in the bottom, human physical simulations. So all of these kinds of coupled AI coupled simulators are needed in agriculture and food as well. There's many agricultural data sets out there. So I just referenced one paper. Here's 34 just from one paper. Many, many out there. Uh, there's a lot of unique problems to building models for agriculture we don't see in other domains. So we need to focus on how do we build these unique models. 
there's a lot of potential for synthetic and simulated data, as I mentioned earlier. And I think this is a role that we can play as the AI institutes is building out both the AI, ag AI data benchmarks and models and developing the infrastructure around these coupled simulators that we can share and develop as a community. And that's a perfect interface as it's been shown in other uh, areas for going between industry, society, and uh, academia. So I think that's that's a big role we've got and a lot of us are pushing that forward. Um, I'm at five minutes. I'd say one, one project we're doing here is called AgML. This is starting to do this, but by no means are we the only ones working on this, but I think their concerted centralized effort is key. So thank you, I'll stop there and we'll let Harold jump back in. Thanks very much, Mason. That was, that was great, actually. And appreciate that you uh, did the segue to AI Farms there for Vikram to talk now <laughs> in, the, in the visual, which was perfect. And uh, Vikram, I was just, you know, in looking at your background, I've, I've, that reminded me, I wanted to say that I'm, you're at University of Illinois and you're, you know, you're the director of this AI Institute that you'll describe in a moment, but you and Ilias Tagopoulos, who wasn't able to be here with us, you know, you, you and Ilias represent something very, very important, which is you guys are leaders in computer sciences and AI with the pedigrees and experiences and track records to back that up. And, and you're, you know, thankfully for whatever reasons it is really appreciative you're in, you've chosen to be in academia and you've pro, you know, chosen to be at land grant um, institutions and the talent, you know, the talent situation is real in data sciences and computer science and AI. And so, you know, we're having a lot of great conversations about looking forward and, and how this can enhance collaboration amongst land grants. One of the questions is how do we make sure that people like you and Ilias actually, you know, really are motivated for whatever reason to participate with us. So I just want to say grateful that you are and really looking forward to hearing hearing your comments about the institute you lead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, couldn't agree more. I do think that um, my screen just one second yeah i do think that um education is going to be a hugely important part of making um ai and data science successful as a way to create these kinds of collaborations and to develop the technologies that we need and in fact i'll say a few more words about that but i really appreciate the opportunity to be here um and as harold said i'm uh, the pi of the ai farms ai institute we have uh, seven institutions that are part of this, and Olga talked briefly about this earlier in her talk, so I won't spend too much more time except to say that three of these are land-grant uh, universities, so uh, uh, Illinois is one, but also Michigan State University and Tuskegee. Um, and we have a number of collaborative projects between these institutions. I am not gonna spend too much time talking about AI farms broadly, um, so, because I really do want to focus on the uh, collaborations that we are trying to put in place and give these examples of how I think um, institutions can in fact work together uh, in practice. And I'll actually give examples from two projects. One is AI Farms and the other is CROPS, which is an NSF Science Technology Center, which I talk about in a moment. In AI Farms, uh, uh, I, we have some, several examples of collaboration between Illinois and Tuskegee which is an 1890 uh, land grant uh, institution. And these collaborations have revolved around a number of different areas. So data sets are one mechanism for enabling sharing, but in fact, AI, as I'm sure you all uh, know, uh, is much broader than that. And uh, so some of the areas we've collaborated on include computer vision, uh, robotics, and a common robotics platform can really enable collaboration in, in, in important ways machine learning for hyperspectral data, which is very much based on data sets, but also farm bots, which is a automated gantry for autonomous planting activities. We also have a very closely, um, uh, a joint program for summer uh, undergraduates that we work on very closely together. And I'll say a little bit more about uh, education in a moment. In a second project, which is called CROPS, the Center for Research and Programmable Plant Systems, this is an NSF science and technology center where we are partnering with Cornell. And there again, we are collaborating on a number of areas that directly uh, relate to AI and data science, where the broad goal in CROPS is to use plants, read plants as 
sensors of their own environment to give early warning, for example, of nutrient stress, drought stress, disease, and so on. And so we're, we're developing this uh, concept we call the Internet of Living Things, IOLT, which is a variant of IoT, and um, using <clears throat> robotics, not only for phenotyping, but also as mobile sensing platforms to be able to collect data from plants in fields at large scale in order to collect this kind of data. And, and that directly drives machine learning techniques, um, data-driven science to be able to uh, sense behavior in the fields, but also understand plant uh, biology. These are just some specific examples of areas where we are developing collaborations. But I wanted to say a little bit more about a longer term effort to build a large scale shared data set, because I think it illustrates both the huge opportunities, but also some of the challenges in creating these kinds of data sets. Um, uh, as the previous speaker noted, Mason said, um, developing data, common shared data sets like ImageNet, for example, and, and, and many others has been foundational to enabling collaboration and enabling progress in many other disciplines. It is, there are a number of, such, of, of significant challenges in doing this for agriculture because of the sheer diversity of plant behavior in different environments. And so we have developed <clears throat> by we, I, um, I'm sorry, I'm using sort of the royal we, or I had no role in this and I claim no credit. This is an effort that's been going on for many years across four large data centers. And they have developed a large data set that includes um, uh, genome sequences for over 800 variants of sorghum, along with a wide range of different phenotypes for uh, these sorghum lines in many different locations, in the different environmental conditions across many years. And this data set is now driving new research, both in a <clears throat> bioenergy research center called CABI and in AI farms, um, including new AI research uh, on, um, uh, on high throughput phenotyping, on genome sequencing, on uh, genome-wide association studies, and how AI can be used to, to tackle these kinds of problems. And I think what this example illustrates is that to be able to develop a data set that can actually be correlated across different environmental conditions and, and where you can actually do scientifically grounded, well-grounded studies requires a lot of coordination, a lot of investment over many, many years. Um, at the same time, um, I don't want to overstate the problem either. I think there are smaller data sets that can be done in a single project over a few years that are valuable as well if it's deliberately planned and carefully coordinated. And I do think that this kind of coordination and investment is what's critical in order to be able to develop use scientifically useful data sets. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna uh, cover one more slide because I, I wanted to say a few words about education. I think that uh, both as Mason said, um, as Harold said and, and others have said before, um, Workforce training and, and the talent gap in AI is absolutely crucial today. And at the same time, we, it sort of is an opportunity too, because there's clearly extraordinary demand for AI among students. In fact, over 60% of the applicants to our graduate program in computer science at Illinois all want to do AI research for their PhDs. 60% out of over a thousand applications is quite an extraordinary number. And that demand, I think, enables, um, sort of gives us an opportunity to create more collaborative efforts across institutions, for example, through online uh, courses. So, so we're developing at Illinois an, an online degree program, which is a Master of Engineering in Digital Ag that covers topics like uh, machine learning, robotics, IoT, and others. And um, this is available both in terms of uh, certificates, which are uh, specific topics, as well as a full degree, but it's available to students all around the country and it can really enable collaboration across different uh, schools. We are uh, doing an AI summer school for uh, training students, which has brought in over 30 students from, I forget the exact number, but more than 10 institutions uh, that had hackathon at the end of it. Um, we are developing a program called ICANN to enable pathways into computer science for non-CS majors. 
And again, uh, this is being done largely online. That wasn't the original intent, but COVID has sort of driven us in that direction. But in fact, now that enables people from all over the country and even outside to be able to develop the, the computer science skills they need to enter AI and data science. And there are many other opportunities as well where education can really become a mechanism to collaborate across universities, including land grant universities. And I think that's something that we really should try and take advantage of. I'll stop there. I'll be happy to take more questions after the end of this uh, sequence of talks. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and I think, you know, capitalizing on the extraordinary demand for AI, I'd also put in that there, there is, there is this growing extraordinary, I guess, interest by, you know, the next generation, let's call it, of students who really, really, you know, they, they get fundamentally that food and ag is, you know, a mega sector that can impact the grand challenges we face. And so hopefully that's something that can help us get more and better talent into the space right. as well. So, um, so um, our last uh, panelist will be Gregory Bernard and Gregory A, thank you for joining us. B, I, I'm not prepared to introduce you because I was going to introduce Olga. And, uh, and so thank you very, very much for agreeing to join. Obviously, um, your colleague Olga is in the air right now, and she made some great comments earlier. But I, I will leave it to you if, if you wouldn't mind um, introducing yourself briefly. And, and also, um, obviously, you're part of the AI Farms um interaction that Vikram is leading so looking forward to hearing hearing your thoughts and especially looking forward to hearing how the interaction is going you know um, between Tuskegee and the others in context of the um, land grant collaborations between the 62s and the 90s in this case so anyway over to you Gregory no problem and thank you so much for inviting me um yes I did get uh, this notice uh, last night but our, our dean she's so busy and she works so so very hard that I'm, I'm happy to step in and thank you for uh, a director showing for um, inviting me and also helping me helping prepare. And so very quickly, I'll talk about um, the importance of our collaboration uh, with the Center of Digital Agriculture through AI Farms. And of course, um, to, to preface that we know, if you look at evolutionary genetics, uh, we know that diversity is the key to longevity. And so in living systems as well as living organizations uh, diversity is very 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 key and so one of the things uh, director showing asked me uh what were some of the ingredients um that made our interaction with uh, the center of digital agriculture and university of illinois um so impactful and i told her one, one of the more more important um, components was inclusion and empowerment um dr davi um and of course, Dean Bowden Tiller brought us in at the ground floor of the AI Farms project. And so we were um, included, and then we were tasked to actually develop a microsite, AI microsite at Tuskegee based on the AI, AI2 um, center at uh, University of Illinois, the center of the digital, digital ag. And so we were asked to develop um, our own research objectives that coincides with the overall AI Farms mission. And so that was very important. Um, to actually empower um, us to uh, develop these solutions in assistance. And so um, Dr. Ainsworth, Dr. Chahari, we've worked with them and we have continued, continued to work with them since the, the start of the AI Farms uh, project. And we've collaborated on several other grants. Uh, one grant now that I was just notified that I'm, we are submitting now that I need to actually um, uh, submit to our OSP today <laughs> so that they can review it and submit it before the deadline. And I'll talk briefly about that in a second. And so one of the, one of the projects that um, we've been working here at Tuskegee under developing an AI microsite um, analogous to the one at uh, the University of Illinois, the Center of Digital Ag, or the inclusion of autonomous farming uh, tools uh, such as the farm bot. And so last summer we had our student, student interns actually uh, assemble uh, the farm bot, which was developed by Roy Orenson and others. And we've had students, uh, Jasmine Boone and Christian Peterson, travel to University of Illinois to get um, experiential training in AI analysis of ethograms. And so this has been very um, impactful, uh, particularly as we 
uses information to develop ethograms that are site specific for our um, Tuskegee animal production. Uh, the grant that I'm speaking of now that, um, <laughs> that we're working to turn in today is going to focus on using autonomous tools and crop health diagnostics for minority and small scale farmers. And so uh, Dr. Adave, Director Adave is, is actually served as a co-PI as well as Dr. Ainsworth and Dr. Uh, Chahari and Dr. Upa uh, Lapati. And so our goal here is to take the information and the knowledge that we're receiving from our collaboration with AI Farms and help to further um, um, expose and provide the, these technologies to our small scale farmers and particularly our minority small scale farmers. We know that 90% of all farming it are of course um, it comes from small scale farmers, but they are a lot of they are resource limited, and they do not have a lot of access to the technologies uh, that are involved with modern precision farming. And so we are <clears throat> we are mandated to actually uh, provide extension and provide these technologies. And in this grant that we are developing now, we'll provide a free crop health diagnostic for our, our minority and small scale farmers, both in Alabama and Illinois. So that will facilitate a um, exchange of ideas and uh, technologies between both universities and um, of course, both states, as we try to um, directly target the small scale farmers, minority and small scale farmers for inclusion to these technologies. And so from the, from the work that we do, of course, we do a lot of outreach and extension. Um, as myself, as a professor, I have a teaching research and extension um, component. And so uh, the technologies and the things that we, um, we develop and we, um, with the Center of Digital Ag, we actually use that to expand to other um, teachers. And so we've had visiting collaborators that have um, visited our facilities and to uh, understand and uh, identify some of the autonomous tools that we're working on so they can implement them into their school systems. Uh, we work a lot with the local small scale farmers and trying to, as I said before, introduce these technologies to them and have them uh, properly included, as well as our um, stakeholders, student participants and other stakeholders that we will uh, meet during small farmers conferences, uh, the PAWC Professional Agriculture Workers Conference, and many professional meetings where we can actively engage with our stakeholders and target audiences. Uh, that being, of course, the uh, small scale farmers, farmers in general, and, and then uh, USDA. A lot of work in the, in the local school systems. Um, uh, this, so we, uh, uh, some are RU programs. I'm at, in fact, I'm in two right now. And <clears throat> we, we try to get this information, this knowledge transferred and make it translatable so that we empower the next generation. You can see that we actually have a lot of student presentations. So the AI farms, um, we, we meet a lot as Dr. Adavi knows. And I think that that was very important as we talk about inclusion, uh, as the AI farms initiative was um, in its infancy, Dr. Adavi was very uh, key on having us meet weekly in, in order to gauge our thoughts and help us to build our collaboration in, in an efficient way from the ground up. And so that was very empowering for us and also empowering for our students. As you see here, um, even uh, through virtual meetings, we were able to um, process and relay what developments that we are doing here on our end to support the AI Farms overall objectives. And so finally, uh, as I said before, it's about empowering the next generation. If you look at this young lady's t-shirt, which I love this shirt, it says, forget princess, I want to be a scientist. And so we, we uh, empower our students and uh, Tia Archie is one of the students in our TU START um, student agriculture research team, which is funded by USDA funding. Uh, they actually, these, these students actually uh, work on grant projects, particularly our USDA projects and help to, um, to complete grant objectives. And so that helps us to harness their power and to provide um, a lot of highly skilled agricultural uh, workers to enter, enter the workforce. And I think I will end with that. I hope I, I've, I've addressed and answered any, any um, questions. Well, you definitely gave us some great fodder for questions. So I, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> so I wanna thank you again for, for doing this. And actually um, you and Tom 
both uh, so Tom who started and you just finished up you just really connected really well to this previous workshop I had mentioned that that we had on team science um, and Jenny Cross who spoke and what you mentioned about you know Vikram and how you guys were meeting weekly so you you were building you know building this small team the right way from the beginning and you know and it, and it produces so anyway really appreciate that and I just wanted to call that out so from a panel um perspective so we've got um we've got 15 minutes we'll do a wrap up at 55 minutes past the hour so got about 15 minutes here so a few questions that i'm going to start with and then um and then the the you know the committee will have rights to ask questions um so one one question steven i just wanted to start specifically with you and that is you know since you're in this uh over you know, sort of oversight position with respect to USDA NIFA, um, you know, what do you have any thoughts that you wanted to highlight from um, Tom's talk, given his sort of macro overview? Is there anything that really caught your attention that is really on you guys' mind at the USDA level, you know, from a macro level? So, Stephen, you know, any any thoughts from your end? And you're on mute. See, okay, kind of varies a lot. Yeah, um, I was. I want to um, talk a little about what Greg mentioned first, um, and I have a I have a question because Dennis at uh, Ebadagi and I at NIFA have been tossing around an idea to come up with a program that targets small and mid-sized farms in in the AI space. Right now, it's a very broad program. Most of the applications are. Uh, centered on the large farms. And so a uh, question I had for Greg, uh, what, let's see if I missed that. Did you um, apply for a grant in this area? Uh, did I catch that correctly? And where did you um, send it? Yeah, so, so the Sustainable Agricultural uh, Systems Grant, which is uh, okay. due tomorrow, <laughs> I, yeah. I was actually um, are submitting an application today. And so I just got word that our office of sponsored programs is ready to uh, review it for the final submission. So Dr. Dobby is actually serving as a co-PI along with Dr. Chihari and Dr. Ainsworth and Dr. Um, Upalapati uh, from the Center of Digital Ag at uh, University of Illinois. So this is also another um, follow-up of the Farms of the Future grant that was awarded to um, uh, Dr. Chihari which also addresses uh, small scale farmers and the use of cover cropping uh, using these autonomous tools. And so we, we want to get these technologies um, to the small scale farmer um, who, who need them, who need the exposure and to provide these free diagnostic services for them so that we can increase their um, sustainability in, in, in agricultural production, which we, we all know is very important. We just talked about how 90% of all farm is from small scale farmers. And then, of course, our minority farmers, of course, are going to need even more targeted inclusion. And so um, we are thankful to work with the Center of Digital Ag and Dr. Adab, Director Adave so that we can actually develop this AI microsite here at Tuskegee so we can empower and expose um, local small scale farmers here, as well as the University of Illinois. So the grant we're working on now, um, develop, we're developing now will both target these minority and small scale farmers in Alabama and also in the University of Illinois. So there'll be an inter, inter um, exchange uh, of um, technologies as the uh, PIs from uh, University of Illinois will travel here and we will travel um, along with our students um, to the University of Illinois and meet with the farmers in Illinois and they will meet with the farmers here in Alabama. So it becomes a very good cross um, disciplinary and, and cross institutional exchange of ideas with the overall goal of supplementing and empowering not only the next generation of agricultural workers, but our um, present and next generation of small scale farmers. Okay, yeah, this that's the big money uh, program. I, I, you know, Dennis and I are gonna be looking for stakeholder input on what a smaller program might look like. And uh, so we may be calling um, many people for that, but, we're trying to, we're debating on whether to uh, create a whole new program, which might be problematic if we don't have additional funding or modify one of the ones we have already. 
A uh, second thing I want to point out um, in general, you know, and Ann Stapleton and I have talked about this, about the five-year limitation on funding for these efforts. And in general, let me um, pull up something, you know, and we don't really, we're not really sure from a government perspective where there is a push for long-term cyber infrastructure development for agriculture. You know, we have these five, five year limited grants. We can, uh, many of the institutes can leverage grants that they have. I, I know AI Farms is able to combine and leverage from several different areas. We have funded or NSF has funded. However, they're on a similar time scale which is, you know, at best, we may be able to get something for seven years or something if, if we time these things correctly. And so, you know, NS Anne made the point, this is coming from her really, that NSF has put together various approaches, but they are limited by the five-year limit also. And I just, it would, and, and we follow the farm bill, you know, we follow, follow what Congress wants and being, being the agency, we cannot lobby for this, but, um, you know, I think that's a real need. And, and so I'm going to turn this around a little bit. This, this, um, you know, this particular meeting, I'm, I'm looking at it from an evaluator's point of view, not to scare anybody. That's not my purpose. But to, uh, to see where we may be able to uh, do better in that respect, you know, what are, gonna, what are the long-term sustainable aspects that we can continue after the five years is over? And Vikram has a comment, I think. I'd be glad to listen to that. Uh, if I may, I just want to uh, second what Steve just said and actually turn it to the Blue Ribbon panel, because to me, it seems that you folks on this panel may have the standing to uh, make this case that, so for example, with NSF, there is a difference. The science and technology centers in NSF, even though they're initially funded for five years, they're routinely renewed for another five years. So it's very common that they sort of start out with an assumption that it's really gonna be a 10 year effort. And in agriculture, because so many activities are really have to be studied over the long term to understand the impacts, for example, on soils, on environment, and on uh, many different kinds of data sets that really require longitudinal study. I think longer term investments are critical. And so to make a case that um, agricultural center, research centers as well also have a longer term time horizon seem like a, seems like a really valuable point to be able to make if you can. Well, just to build on that real quick is um, so at one level there's the you know at one level there's the the sort of okay data as a strategy point that Tom laid out uh, and, you know and then sort of within that strategy and laddering up what you guys represent is a very you know you're the advanced data analytics capability this this program of the AI institutes and so one one question I wanted to throw out to you guys as as a as a panel and you know please multiple people answer is do you think it's possible that these AI, AI institutes so if it was agreed that land grants were going to you know take an, a strategic approach data as strategy would these AI institutes you know would they be these nodes or centers of excellence for data analytics that could then you know sort of enable this overall strategy um, because I don't think it's possible that every institution, every university or every college is great at advanced data analytics. I don't think that works with computer science, you know, that strategy. So it'd be interesting to hear you guys, you know, maybe part of the long-term perpetuation of this in the right way is that these institutes you guys have formed are actually these centers of excellence. Um, maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong, but I'd love to hear the panel respond to that. I can say something about that. I'm sure the others have thoughts too, but I, I agree. I think that these AI institutes are really bringing together, each one of them is bringing together multiple in part, uh, partner institutions, um, 
I think every one of us has minority institutions as well as part of this. So some of the 1890 institutions like Tuskegee and, and Gregory really has been a leader in, in AI farms for this role. Um, and all four AI institutes are led by land grant universities. So Illinois, Iowa State, Washington State, and UC Davis are all land grants, if I understand right. So we really are pulling together AI expertise, but it's also bringing it uh, across institutions because every one of us is seven or eight or even 10 partners in some cases. So I think that they are centers of AI expertise, but also shared expertise across multiple institutions. I, I would agree. And I would say that, um, you know, uh, these are the current centers of excellence for building, uh, for the digitization of, of ag and food tech and building, you know, that data as a strategy. And um, if we don't do it here, where well, else will it happen? I mean, right now, um, the largest, a, either the largest data sets in agriculture um, are owned by private companies that you, we, you know, can't, people can't get access to for, for innovating, um, or they simply don't exist. A and uh, so I think that this is where the intersection of this, these institutes exist to, to be those experts, to pull industry, other universities, um, other partners together, large and small, to, to build these new tools, to build these data sets. There's so many crops. There's so many products, there's so many aspects of the food system that all need digitization um, that if we don't do it in these centers, um, we're really gonna, gonna lag behind um, the development of other nations around the world and developing these capabilities like China. Um, so, so, you know, let's build on that expertise through these centers and, and it will take time because um, compared with healthcare, which has had uh, digital tools and systems to manage patients for a number of years, those have not existed and don't exist in the same way in the agri-food sector and need to be created. So, so, uh, so this is where I think these institutes can help and advance the strategy. Oh, for that, Gabe, it would be um, just taking, paying attention to time. I want to make sure, Catherine, you, you get a chance to pitch in your question for the panel. So thank you. And, and so this question is, is largely aimed at Vikram, but I'd love to hear from anyone else. And it's about data. Uh, and as you, you spoke about the, the existing large data sharing uh, that you're already involved in doing. And I'm wondering if you could say a few words about the time commitment and the expertise involved in the governance of the management of these projects and the management of these data. Because I, I think my opinion is that that's an area that we rarely give enough attention to as we're setting up these collaborative projects. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I will say that the, the data sets that I was referring to came out of scientific collaborations by small groups of researchers who had this as a primary research goal for themselves. And so it didn't need a high level management oversight to make it happen, but in fact, what we've, I think, realized is that we got lucky that through a combination of a sequence of multiple such collaborations, this data set has developed across all these different centers. And so if you really wanted to do this in a more intentional, proactive way from the beginning, rather than just get wait to get lucky, then I completely agree. I think then we need that kind of management oversight and that, and that planning and the foresight to put together the right people and the right resources to collect that data. And you don't need tens of millions of dollars to do it. You need some significant amount of funding, but you need some planning and you need some coordination. Other, from the panel, other thoughts to add on to what Vikram said on that one? Because I mean, that is totally fundamental what Catherine just asked. I might, Mason, uh, yeah, 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 I might add just one thing. Um, it, I, I fully agree with what, Vikram saying in this, we just want to add on that there's an important piece of this is developing and maintaining and making accessible data. Um, it's like you said, it's not a small task, but it's bigger than we usually think. And it's often, you know, when you're thinking of software development team, when you're trying to update, maintain, run quality control, these sorts of things, that takes many people, right? It's not, and we often maybe, it's hard for us to build in those types of, and they're usually well-paid in industry. 
So there's a lot of competition for software engineers, data engineers in industry. And as a result, it's hard for us to A, afford, you know, a $180,000, $200,000 a year salary for a software engineer, much less a team of them. So I think like having that capacity and that avail that could be some, you know, shared, like that is, it seems like would be a good shared resource across institutes, especially on multi-institutional types of, I mean, when I say multi, I mean, multiple AI institutes, even working uh, on this kind of shared data platform or whatever it might be that, that does seem like we, we could use some additional attention and resources in that area. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, and I know we're, we're nearing the end here. And, and I think the frustration that I feel right now must be shared by everybody, <laughs> which is we literally could easily go on for hours on, on this. I mean, with no problem whatsoever. Um, so anyway, I just want to, you know, I, I want to close with a few thoughts here and then Catherine, I'll turn it over to you to, to, to adjourn the meeting. Um, you know, a few thoughts. One is the connectivity between you know, this session and what Jenny Cross talked about in the team science thing is just like, you know, very, very obvious. And I think this, you know, this concept, Tom, that you brought out that data is the strategy. Data has to be the organization, therefore, too, because organization follows strategy. And, um, and so we need to think pretty deeply about that. And um, and I think Vikram, you know, what you were referring to and Catherine, you were just asking about is really, really important, which is it's the, it is this investing in the systemic overview. So one of the things that came through here, and I knew it would, but I want to make sure we don't get distracted by is, are there lots of papers that are being published with respect to AI and, and you know, data science and food and agriculture? Yes, there's tons of papers. Um, and, you know, the, the curve is going exponential in Mason. I'm glad you showed that. That does not mean that, oh, everything's great, you know, in terms of food and ag's got this, you know, <laughs> sort of taken care of and the land grants are all set with their, you know, data science platforms and this is all going to go just fine. I think what, you know, what Gabe, you mentioned is this is at a strategic level in an enterprise and our nation as an enterprise, this is a competitive situation. And just because we're publishing a lot of papers and there's a lot of projects doesn't actually mean that we're setting ourselves up to really, you know, really embrace this in the future going forward. There needs to be a systemic investment and we you know and there and, and 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 data science is perfectly positioned to genuinely enhance collaboration between all all the land grants and so i think this session did a great job of highlighting that and really really appreciate everyone taking the time to participate so with that i'm going to turn it over to you catherine to to take us to the close here well thank you harold and i'll be very brief uh i am very grateful to each and every person who shared with us their expertise and their experience in this particular space. I think the examples were just right on and, and very helpful to the committee in our deliberations and in our thinking uh, as, as we uh, draw to conclusion uh, with our work. So again, I express my, my uh, gratitude to each of you and to each of our participants. Thank you for your questions. Um, and thank you for joining us uh, today in this particular workshop. We hope you'll also join us tomorrow in our upcoming workshop on, on a different topic, but related to the overall theme. Uh, again, uh, my gratitude to uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, for setting up this important set of questions for us. And with that, I will say uh, goodbye to all of you and thank you again for participating.